Hi all, um, welcome back. My name's Akil from Our Mortgage Broker. I hope you're doing very well. Today I'm joined by Adam Lawrence. Adam Lawrence is a, a great property enthusiast, um, a co-owner of Partners in Property as well. Um, today I'm going to be asking Adam about his property journey, how he came into property, how, he's, how his property business model is changing or going to be changing going forward coming out of COVID and more about his investment strategies around residential property. Adam, thanks for joining me. You're welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. Great. Adam, tell us a bit, bit about yourself and how you got into property. Um, so I've got a fairly sort of non-traditional career path, really. I spent a lot of time. So my, my corporate experience is wealth management related. So I was, uh, uh, worked in wealth management in Switzerland for a couple of boutique firms. Um, but also on the side and then more seriously i was a sports arbitrage trader so i used to uh, basically buy and sell bets and guarantee profits and lock in profits okay. um in the sort of early days of internet betting so that was a really interesting sort of um lesson really i suppose in risk and then a lot of what i learned about diversification i picked up when i was in wealth management as well so when i was in wealth management i built portfolios for uh, ultra high net worths that were supposed to be resilient and withstand shocks like the one we're going through at the moment so that was back in the last the middle of the last decade so lots moved on since then although the swiss were already sort of light years ahead of the uk in terms of financial advice and all the rest of it really um and then other than that i worked uh, after i did an mba i did a project in one of the uk's top 10 mortgage lenders as a sort of cross business consultant so that gave me a really good sort of take on uh, particularly on the mortgage side of things, credit risk, operational risk. I got involved in all of those departments, um, product, uh, very, very, and the, the operation of the building society. And also, I took a lot of the cues over how I run my funding model um, as a property investor, as a portfolio investor, from the way that the building societies run their models, because it's very pragmatic, sensible, easy to understand, relatively low risk. So, learned a lot from that, really. So, that's me. That sounds good. So I guess your background is around around businessing, mitigating risk, and how to plan for the um, the um, the unforce, uh, the um, the potential issues that we might see going forward. So that's great to hear. Um, we I've I've come across um, you and I meet you at a lot of your networking events. Now, as I said, you are a co-founder of Partners in Property. Um, I visited the one in London. I visited the one in Bristol. Do you want to just tell us a bit more about how Properties in Partner was founded? How people can get involved in in, in networking in your um, your meet. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I founded it in 2017 alongside Sue Sims. That was in Birmingham. Um, we had an option for um, an ice venue, um, some good people that were already meeting on a monthly basis. We went for a daytime meet. Um, we saw there was a big gap. So I'd, done a, I'd, I'd been lucky enough to get into a few private networking events that weren't sort of advertised anywhere that were had some really really serious investors in and it really upped my network and it helped me up my game and I thought it's a real shame that there isn't anything like that out there because um, a lot of the others not not necessarily the London meets because there's some fantastic independent meets in London um, but a lot a lot of the other bigger corporate meets multi-event meets are only geared to really sell people training courses at the end of it um, and that unfortunately keeps some of the really serious investors away because they see through all the sort of smoke and mirrors really. So we found it with that in mind, just to be very pragmatic, very straight talking, very much to try and do business with people who are in the room um, and provide a safe environment for people to do business with each other. So try and keep the, the sharks out of the water as well. But it's very sort of, it, it's not a room whereby, um, it's a very, very friendly, very, very approachable, but it's also not a place where you won't be found out if you are over fluffing what your skill level experience and all the rest of it are so we've kind of done what we set out to do we've now got five locations um birmingham central london canary wharf manchester southampton and bristol where under normal circumstances we meet on a monthly basis at each location um, at the moment we are doing online meets um a lot of online facebook lives in our private facebook group and we have dedicated whatsapp groups for each region um as well so we've got lots and lots of engagement and content going on at the moment all the regions have a a, a weekly zoom coffee while lockdown is on so we can all try and stay in touch and really find out where the challenges are and where we we're able to support really so that's that's pip in you know 90 seconds really 
No, that's great. And, and I'm a big um, advocate of networking and I do it for two reasons. One is to self-educate myself because I like to hear what's going on and, and, and listening to um, entrepreneurs and, and the strategies that they're taking forward. And then the second play is that I'm in business to network and I want to introduce myself to potential property investors as well. So yeah, I go there for two reasons and, um, and I go to a lot of networking events and, and yours stands out from the crowd because as you said, it is a daytime event. And I find if people that are turning up to your event in the daytime that two things they are serious about investing in property and the chances of you doing business with them immediately will probably be very very likely as well so no if anybody's got more information and wants to know more about um, partners in property i will leave the meets details below in the comments box and i'll definitely recommend um, going to any of the five locations and and um, seeing what you can get out of it whether you're an investor or a, a professional as well um Adam, I know you're a resi guy. I know you prefer residential property over commercial, and I've seen you on uh, yeah. numerous Zoom videos, so you, you don't hide behind the curtain. Tell us why residential. Um, tell us what your um, business strategy is going to be coming out of COVID, and has anything changed? Okay, great questions. Um, first of all, why resi? I think it's accessible for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think the risk profile is a lot lower than commercial generally speaking so i'm not against commercial investment but i think it's the sort of thing you uh, graduate into to an extent when you've got uh, either lots of resi or lots of other other investments or you start with a very very large sum of money in the first place potentially whereas resi is much more accessible for those sort of starting out who save their first deposit i guess um so that's a big big driver for me um long-term returns so when i looked into it i noticed that um, leverage buy to let had returned um, the most money of any asset class over a 20 year period in the UK. Um, and the second best was unleveraged buy to let third best was commercial. So ultimately the figures dictate now a lot of that was driven by capital growth. Um, although there, there's not necessarily any reason for capital growth to be over. I don't think either. So that, that's a, another, maybe another subject for another day when we're not in a, the middle of a lockdown. Um, but, Generally speaking, I think uh, if you do it well, and there are sort of four key areas that I think you need to do well in order to do resi well, then it's a bit more secure. Whereas commercial, regardless of, you know, what, what have we seen at the moment, for example, and this is exactly a kind of situation where you would expect um, the risk profile to make a difference to returns. Commercial rents collected across the country are, are reported at 56% at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, from and, and that's on the back of a quarter where, you know rent day was 26th of march so ultimately they traded for all of that up to about four or five days before and and half of them still didn't pay their rent and that includes big big companies who've got lots and lots of cash you know primark super people who are considered to be really really grade a covenants are still taking the chance not to pay um not saying they won't but while they're protected by um various bits in the coronavirus bill um we'll see what they're doing and of course if you're negotiating stuff like that, rather than you negotiating with an individual person and a tenant, you negotiate with a sophisticated person on the other end um, who's got targets to meet and probably uh, quite a detailed negotiation strategy you're going to have to deal with. So we're, we're probably going to see rents adjusted downwards, I think, for um, a lot, certainly a lot of retail. Uh, so I think the the risk thing is is definitely a driver. Um, also the tradability of the asset. So it's a lot easier to trade resi on. Um, than it is to trade commercial on just because the marketplace is bigger um, and you don't have uh, painful voids if you've got properties that have got business rates on them um, per se you can tend to if you if you work it well you can relet them relatively easily rather than sort of accept six to twelve month void as standard and I think if you've got a portfolio of stuff that can have those sorts of length of voids you need you know 20 30 units before you start to get any level of protection um, whereas you don't need to be that big in resi before you start to get some diversification benefits of holding multiple units so that's the sort of and, and the finance is cheaper as well the finance is cheaper and tends to be less um, pernicious so your commercial loans are normally have got loan to value covenants um, whereas the resi ones especially with these little package lenders just tend to be um, there we go we've got you know 75 percent mortgage there um, they've already they've, they securitize the loan they don't come back to you for five years. There's no LTV covenants and all the rest of it. Um, so it's a lot easier. Whereas in a commercial, if you have a surprise uh, CVA or a void or a tenant go bankrupt, 
um, it's all very well if it were all your leases are all PG and FRI'd and all that. people have Corona proof covenant. I guess, but I doubt very many people are in that position realistically. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot more uh, downside risk there, and it's it's the one where if I've got a house that's worth 150 grand with a tenant in it. As soon as the tenant vacates, it's probably worth 150 grand. Um, whereas if I've got a commercial worth 150 grand and the tenant vacates, it might be worth 75 grand or 90 grand or 110 grand overnight because the value is in the covenant. And a lot of people, I don't think, understand how powerful that is. So it's all very well if you can buy it at its lowest and then sell it at its highest or, or sweat it at its highest. But there's a lot more volatility. And, and my background leads me to want, with larger volatility, I want better returns. Whereas what I see is lower returns, but I do accept there can be less effort involved in commercial. Um, but at scale, the effort is not really a big deal because ultimately it's someone else putting the effort in. Um, and then you managing managing the managers, if you will. No, that's fantastic. And thank you, Adam, for that. That's some great nuggets there. And it's stuff, it's stuff, it's stuff like that I actually talk to my clients about as well. And they ask me, should I now go into commercial property? And the question I ask them is, where are you in your investing journey, right? So have you got a whole mm -hmm. portfolio, a residential portfolio that have got good tenants in there, you know, good tenant profiles? And how liquid are you? Because as you did say, commercial finance is a lot more dearer. Um, however, there are options and there are value add opportunities in commercial. So I always ask the client where they are in their property investment journey. And the other thing is you've got to look at, especially the market that we're in, is what are the change of use options? Now, with commercial, there is, I think, I do believe there are multiple options of change of use. And you can do that via PD as well, which is great. So for those that don't know what PD is, it's permitted development. Um, the other issue that I would say around commercial is, yes, you've got, the, um, you've got great options to secure great covenants and they could benefit you the long term. But as we're seeing at the moment, and as you touched on, there's only a 50, 50 odd percent of, um, of rent paid for Q2 of 2020. So that's not great. That's not a great number to be, um, to be, uh, to look at. So I think there's loads of pros and cons. And I do tell my clients when they are looking for finance and strategy, because our mortgage broker advisors don't just help with finance. We help with business strategy as well and how going forward best to do so. But I think it's key that you have a great blend in your portfolio. So I think potentially have a resi portfolio, but maybe dip into commercial because the yields are a lot more higher and usually a bit better in commercial. So if you take a blended point on the, on the yield, you may benefit if you do have a bit of a, a commercial portfolio. But yeah, you're totally right. I think I personally, I'm, I'm a definitely a resi guy. I think residential is always going to be a safe bet. Uh, we've got a shortage of housing and we've always had that in the UK. We've got aging population as well, right? So I think, I think resi is the way forward, but I think if you want to uh, not keep your eggs in all one basket, I think there's uh, there's multiple asset vehicles that you should invest in. And it's like residential, right? Have a, have a single dwelling asset, have a buy to let, have a HMO, have some short term let. So there are multiple avenues of generating those, those greater yields. Um, thank you, Adam, for that. What I want to ask. I totally agree with that. I think that's good. Good. To us. Thank you. What I want to ask was, has your business plans changed? before entering 2020 and and what are you going to be doing coming out of covid yeah so it's interesting i mean we're looking back at when sort of 2011 when i really started to take it seriously and, and built a business plan um and the the business plan back then was good quality yielding assets um at, bought at the right price so making making money where possible on the way in um, and it served me really really well I think in about 2014, I started to diversify a little bit because that was my my background very much sort of led me down that path. So I diversified into social housing rather than the sort of stuff that you mentioned, although I did also do some HMOs as well. Um, but I was very much built around that core principle, as you said, not enough housing in the UK. Um, and the vanilla boring stuff would, would be here when all the sexy, salty, inspiring stuff had all gone to the wall because there's a there's a recession or whatever um so that 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 still looks the same as now about 25 percent of my rents come from social housing contracts um mm -hmm. and or lha slash uc tenants paying direct so that sort of gives a really nice at the moment looking at that it's a really nice anchor for the portfolio and knowing those 25 percent of rents are coming in um without a shadow of a doubt so it's made the rental click it's great that you touched it's 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 it's
Sorry to butt in. I was going to ask you around the LHA piece. Now, a lot of a lot of the resi landlords have always been in the PRS sector, right? So they want to let out to professionals, good professional tenants, and so on. Do you think you're going to see landlords going after LHA tenants, social tenants, for the reason? Well, of I think a lot of the reason. Yeah. It, yeah, if you if you spoke to to landlords who were involved in that sector, sort of pre 2014, before the freeze on housing benefit. You know, generally speaking, it was the freeze that drove them out because it was freeze plus compliance plus section 24 because it just wasn't it wasn't financially viable anymore. So right. if you take the freeze away from that and then you look at the consideration of covenant strength in resi, you know, is a professional tenant a better covenant at the moment than a UC? I would argue an LHA slash UC tenant has always been the best covenant if they're the right sort of UC or LHA tenant. And therein lies the problem. Because you need very, very skilled agents who are using the right selection processes to get the right sort of tenants like that. You're not going to come across them by putting your property up on Gumtree, for example. You know, it's just not going to work very well for you. So there's a lot of um, there's things to, to be concerned about with, with UC because it's easy enough to get bad tenants in if you don't do your referencing properly um, mm. and you don't go through the process. And if you don't understand communication um, on that level, you know, the best agents have got people who they are all day, every day communicating with people on UC. So they, they empathize and they understand the difficulties of living on £94.25 a week, spare money after your, after your housing's been paid or, or whatever. And, mm. it, and, and it's quite difficult sometimes for landlords to put themselves in those shoes, realistically. So within a caveat, uh, I think, I think landlords will see it as more attractive right now. Um, I think the government have worked hard to try and make that the case. And some of the three and four bed rates are up 20, 25 percent around the country. So money talks in this game, ultimately, yeah. without a doubt. Um, and councils are much more supportive now because they've got much bigger problems than they had six years ago. Um, they're much more supportive now of schemes on top in order to place UC tenants, um, which landlords can also benefit from. So if the council's engaging, if the council is making the right noises and not treating the PRS as an enemy, but as a as a, a a colleague in the housing situation, then I think there's a lot of reasons for landlords to be looking back towards LHA and UC. But I would qualify that by saying, just make sure you use a really good, really experienced LHA manager and don't even can contemplate trying to do it yourself because it's just a hiding to nothing. Great, and I appreciate that. And for those that want to know what LH, LH, LHA stands for, it's Local Housing Association, and UC is uh, Universal Credit, right? So, that's right. Anything you want to leave us? Any? Because I know you're a man of um, great wisdom. Anything you want to leave us with? Well, I think it's a good time to remember. There's a great quote. There's a great page of quotes I saw the other day. Twenty five best Warren Buffett quotes. But the one that the one that um, springs off the page in terms of um, what we want to look at at the moment moment i think is be greedy when others are fearful um yep. that doesn't mean get out there now and buy spend all your money necessarily but it does mean keep that in the back of your mind just as this sort of crisis works its way through the national psyche um yeah. be outside of that be observing it and work out when it's time to be involved don't overexpose yourself but yep. don't be scared because it hasn't changed the overall trajectory of of property as an investment vehicle yeah, and that's wise words. And, I'll, and, I'll, and we say the same thing to our clients as well. And everyone asks, are we, are we at the bottom of housing pricing? Is now the best time to buy? But the answer is no one really knows where we are. Are we going to see a U-shape um, going back up? Are we going to see a V? Are we going to see a W? Who knows? But I always tell my clients, negotiate. You know, I mean, do your research, do your due diligence, talk to finance brokers like us to what the cost of the finance looks like. And then you can offset that against your returns on, on the rental income. And then all, the, other, the other point I always I'll tell my clients is look for value add opportunities. So whether that is residential or commercial, see what else you can do with that property, right? Can you extend it? Can you add another room? Can you change of use, you know, and, and look, look for these opportunities. And, and the team at Our Mortgage Broker, we partnered up with, with the various amounts of professionals. So we work with planning consultants, surveyors, accountants, and, and, and other, other forms of property professionals. So we're always promoting um, our power team and we do that to benefit the client because ultimately we want the client to benefit from good good investment yields, good returns, good capital growth. Um, but we've got to ensure that we do it for the right reasons. And I think property's always been a long game, right? If, if, you, if you win something overnight, it's great, it's a bonus, but you've got to 
I think invest in property with the, the long game, and I mean 10, 20 years, that sort of, uh, that sort of time frame. What, what's your thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. I mean, the same goes for equities, ultimately, doesn't it? Looking at anything under five years as a realistic time horizon is just not realistic because mm -hmm. ultimately, for most of us, it's a slow-moving asset. If you want to exit it, you want to try and exit it when the sun's shining. You don't want to be exiting it at a time like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I couldn't agree with that more in terms of long-term planning. If people want to get in it to get rich quick and all the rest of it, the stuff that's sold on that basis is normally just people giving themselves another job which is worse than their current job for less money in my experience so yeah. i think you absolutely need to take a long-term view but if you do take a long-term view it can absolutely change your life and build a legacy an intergenerational legacy um so it's worth putting the time and effort in to understand that so i think those are wise words as well I appreciate that. Thank you, Adam. Um, for those viewers that are, are interested in mortgages and mortgage advice, um, lenders are back in on the market. We've seen lots of products come on back on the market in the last week or so. We've seen loan to values gradually go back up to the 75 space, um, loan to value space. Um, and if any of those want more information around valuations, now more and more lenders are doing AVM valuations and desktop valuations. Um, do contact us. We can give you more information on what lenders can support you, whether you are purchasing or remortgaging. So do contact us at our mortgage broker. That's enough of our mortgage broker. Adam, thank you for joining me. And I look forward to meeting you at Partners in Property soon. Thanks for having me, Akil. All the best. All the best. Thank you all. Bye-bye.